WCW Halloween Havoc 1997 took place on October 26th in the MGM Grand, attracting around 12,500 fans to the venue and bringing in around 400,000 pay-per-view buys. Wait, wait, what? Let, let me double check that. Um, yeah, Halloween Havoc 1997 was the most successful WCW pay-per-view in terms of pay-per-view buy rates up until this point, only to get topped in 1997 by December's Starcade show, and that's pretty incredible. I'm not very confident in saying it was Hogan vs. Piper that drew this big number because their previous pay-per-view encounters weren't as successful in terms of buy rate, but we can't argue that a show headlined by the Hulkster and the Hot Rod in 1997 drew in bigger pay-per-view numbers than anything the WWF produced all year and that includes Wrestlemania and also the upcoming Survivor Series show featuring Bret Hart vs Shawn Michaels. I mentioned this a few weeks back on Reliving the War but the wrestling industry itself was growing at a rapid rate. People who had never watched wrestling before were getting into it and the Monday Night Wars were creating a new legion of loyal viewers. The numbers would only grow as we approached 1998 on our timeline and then all hell breaks loose. But enough of all that stuff, let's take a look at this pay-per-view and we'll see if those viewers got their money's worth with Halloween Havoc 1997. Yuji Nagata vs Ultimo Dragon starts us off tonight and the first thing you notice is the excessive amount of Slim Jim branding inside and around the ring. The event was promoted as Slim Jim's Halloween Havoc. This match is all about Sonny Ono really, he and Ultimo Dragon parted ways and ever since then Ono has been managing different wrestlers while trying to ruin Dragon's career. Yuji Nagata is Ono's latest henchman so let's see if he can get the job done tonight in Vegas. Neither man goes down after a shoulder block so Dragon tries again. Nagata hits the mat and Dragon brings Nagata down with a leg sweep. Nagata replies with an exploder suplex. We see the Dragon turnbuckle headstand and this gets followed up with the Dragon kick combo. There's only one way Nagata can reply here really and that's with a good old fashioned chin lock. That's what you call real wrestling. When it gets broke up Nagata goes for it again but Dragon counters with a side suplex. Can't really count that one as a second chin lock but the intention was definitely there. A few hard kicks from Nagata gets followed up with a camel clutch and the destruction of Ultimo Dragon continues with a pile driver and a suplex. That's officially chin lock number 2 right there. Sonny Ono likes what he sees, naturally. Dragon then starts absorbing Nagata's kicks and he says, please sir may I have some more before grabbing his opponent's foot and performing a dragon screw. An ultimo dragon screw. <laughs> Nagata takes a few kicks next and he finds himself on the outside but he counters a plancha with another kick. It's kicker be kicking at Halloween Havoc. We see Raven, Saturn, Sick Boy and Smackhead Kidman entering the arena as Dragon performs the Asai Moonsault. Back in the ring Nagata counters a handspring back elbow but Dragon keeps fighting and he performs a corner sunset powerbomb. It only gets a two count though. Dragon tries again with a moonsault, it's another two count. He then tries the Dragon Stanner but Nagata counters and Dragon gets his arm arm dropped on the top turnbuckle. The focused attack on Dragon's left arm is good. Dragon sails it well while Nagata stays relentless but for some reason though Nagata gives up on the arm and he performs a belly to belly before applying the Nagata lock but Dragon makes it to the ropes and our match continues on. Dragon counters a power bomb. we see the Dragon sleeper but Nagata makes it to the ropes. Dragon continues selling the arm after hitting an enziguri and he grabs his arm after another kick combo but he's able to set Nagata up in the corner again and we see see that dragon steiner. He then applies the dragon sleeper to end the match but Nagata counters with an arm bar and dragon has to tap out. Yuji Nagata wins via submission. After the bout Sonny Ono lays in a vicious looking kick right to dragon's injured arm and he then presents Nagata with a bonus for a job well done. Another good pay per view opener here from WCW. Not the best but still good. Disco Inferno sits at the WCW.com booth and Mark Madden wants to know how Disco plans on fighting Jacqueline tonight. Disco says he doesn't know what to do, he can't punch or kick his opponent but he's still gonna find some way to win. He then says cheerleaders don't belong on the field, a woman's place is in the home and just then Jackie shows up and Disco shits in his luminous orange flares. Jackie chases Disco off before we go back to the ring for our next match. It's an unadvertised bout featuring Chris Jericho taking on Gato. 
as in New Japan Pro Wrestling Booker Gato. At this point in his career he was not involved with New Japan but working with FMW and IWA Japan. At this very point in October of 1997 he was touring the United States and he managed to get booked in 1997's biggest pay per view so far. It's a hard hitting affair here with Jericho not holding back at all. Gato established himself as the heel by slapping Jericho across the face during a corner break. Chris made his opponent pay with some stiff kicks to the chest. Gato takes a time out afterwards and Chris is right back at it with some hard chops when the match resumes. Chris skins the cat after almost going out of the ring but Gato comes back with a clothesline and Jericho falls out. He gets back in the ring where he ends up taking two power slams. He then gets locked in a sleeper but he manages to get out by dumping Gato to the mat before hitting a clothesline. Jericho continues to dominate the match with his signature double power bomb, but then there's a failure to communicate perhaps when Jericho goes for a super Frankensteiner. Yeah, that wasn't pretty. Look at Jericho's landing, and with Gato falling on top of him like that, this could have been an absolute disaster. Gato rolls out of the ring to process what the fuck just happened, but Chris shows he's still good to go by performing a plancha, but Gato counters with a dropkick. Gato then performs a unique knee breaker back inside the ropes, but his top rope flying kick gets countered and Chris ends up winning with a lion tamer. Chris was pretty lucky to leave this one with just a busted nose, but even with the botch Frankensteiner it's another decent match up here at Halloween Havoc 1997. Jeff Jarrett left WCW to join the WWF and that means the planned Mongo vs Jarrett match had to get changed for Halloween Havoc. Originally, if Mongo defeated Jarrett then Debra McMichael would have to leave WCW. Debra though has a replacement for Double J and the stipulation still stands. The question is, who's gonna stand in for Jarrett and defend the honour of the lovely Debra McMichael? Mean Gene tries to get answers but Debra's keeping her lips sealed. Big Steve shows up and he wants the diamond ring back along with the credit cards he gave to Debra and Debra says no way Jose, she earned that ring and the cards after putting up with Mongo and his family for all these years. Back in the arena, fans have no idea they are about to witness a classic for the ages. Rey Mysterio faces Eddie Guerrero for the cruiserweight title and if Rey can't win the belt tonight, he has to remove his mask live on pay per view. WCW built this one up by presenting a bunch of Lucha Libre videos hosted by Mike Tanay. Mike would speak about the traditions of Lucha Libre and the importance of the mask. Eddie removed Rey's mask on Nitro and Mysterio's face was briefly exposed but if Eddie wins tonight, Rey has to keep the mask off for good. Eddie screams at Ray that he's gonna take off his mask before swinging a punch but Ray dodges it and we have lightning fast offense to start us off, with Ray getting the better of Eddie. Both men tumble out of the ring but it's Eddie who stays one step ahead and Mysterio gets pulled down from the apron to the outside. After getting rammed into the ring steps, Mysterio gets tossed back in the ring and Eddie performs his apron sent on. Ray replies with a drop kick but his handspring attack gets countered with a back suplex. The crowd already making a lot of noise and we're just getting started. Eddie delivers a vertical suplex followed by a tilt award backbreaker, only scoring a two count for his efforts. He then tries to rip Ray's mask off but he can't get a good grip, so he locks in the abdominal stretch and he again begins pulling the mask. Mysterio then takes a backbreaker that looked like it really hurt but then we see one of the best moves of the match. Guerrero had Mysterio pinned down to the mat but Mysterio jumps up, he stands on the top rope, he then springboards with a backflip and he catches Eddie with a DDT. It takes a little time for the crowd to process the move and they cheer for the babyface when they realise just how insanely athletic Ray's offence was right here. Ray gets Guerrero on the outside but it's Mysterio who falls hard when trying to follow up. Eddie launches Ray into the guardrails before the match gets back inside the ring and Eddie locks in a camel clutch. During the hold, Eddie does a good job of ripping Ray's mask up a little and you can see a genuine look of concern on Ray's face. He did not want to lose the mask on this night and his face was almost completely exposed here once again. Eddie then applies the gory special but Ray gets out with an arm drag, going on to miss his follow up dropkick. Eddie drops Ray back over his shoulder before stretching Ray out a bit on the mat. Eddie keeps the pressure on with strikes in the corner and even though Ray tries to fight back it just isn't enough. Mysterio gets hung up in the tree of woe and Guerrero delivers a dropkick. Eddie then laughs before lining up his next attack but Ray dodges it by lifting his head up and Eddie gets crotched on the big old Slim Jim ring post. Mysterio then performs a crossbody from the top rope to the outside that gets the crowd going nuts and back inside the ring he almost wins the match with a pinning Hurricane Rana but it only gets a two count. Ray then performs a 619 
line, but he catches Eddie in a head scissors before dumping him to the outside. Absolutely incredible. He then only goes and performs a senton into another head scissors and he doesn't end up with a corkscrew attack back inside the ring. All this isn't enough to end the match, so Ray tries an Arabian moonsault but Eddie gets the knees up and Mysterio takes a vicious powerbomb afterwards. Eddie gets frustrated and he wonders what he has to do to end the match and he ends up taking too long while lining up his next attack. Ray sees it coming and he performs a spinning wheel kick. He tries to end it with a west coast pop but he gets caught out with a backbreaker. Eddie then rolls through when Mysterio dodges the frog splash but he stays vigilant and he gets Ray set up on the top turnbuckle. He goes for a crucifix powerbomb but Ray counters and he's able to pin Eddie for the three count. What a fucking match and I really only went over the high spots here. I know I say this a lot but I nor anyone else can do this one justice just by talking about it. Go and watch the match yourself and enjoy the match yourself because it's nothing short of brilliant. Mysterio wins the cruiserweight title in an instant classic at Halloween Havoc but more importantly he gets to keep his mask. It was all thanks to Eddie Guerrero that Ray won this match because Eddie knew what the mask meant to Ray. So a victory really for both guys here. Still, Eddie keeps a little heat by attacking Ray after the bell and throwing him out of the ring. Hulk Hogan says that he feels bad for the folks who paid to see tonight's main event because it ain't gonna happen. Bischoff clarifies by saying WCW has not been able to provide a safe work environment for the most important man in Hollywood. Sting keeps showing up, cages are lowering into the ring, it's just not safe. Eric says Hollywood would wrestle tonight but fan safety should come first. Eric simply can't let Hogan wrestle tonight because it's not safe for anyone at ringside, so the match is getting called off. Unless WCW can provide Bischoff and Hogan with a legally binding agreement that Sting won't show up in tonight's main event, then the match ain't gonna happen, Sting must be barred from the arena or fans are gonna go home disappointed. Hogan says he wins either way, if he wrestles Piper tonight he gets his NWO belt back, Piper stole the belt on Nitro by the way, and if Hogan has to visit Piper's home tomorrow to get that belt then that's fine too. The real shame will be if fans don't get what they paid for tonight and the only way that can be avoided is if WCW give Hogan and Eric that legally binding agreement. Big Steve Mongo McMichael makes his way down to the ring. It's time to find out who his mystery opponent's gonna be. What young strapping good looking lad has Deborah acquired for this matchup? Debra's gonna smoke a big smelly bratwurst after this match. Happy Halloween, motherfuckers. Two. Oh, big bratwurst. There simply wasn't a better man for the job. Debra knows talent when she sees it. We get Alex Wright vs Steve McMichael at Halloween Havoc and joking aside, these two had a tough act to follow. Actually everyone on the card now has a tough act to follow. Tony Schiavone's crying on the headset about Hulk Hogan refusing to work later as the match begins. Alex gets body slammed and he goes to the outside afterwards to get some encouragement from his opponent's wife. Alex then gets annoyed at these Las Vegas losers giving him a negative reaction but it just adds fuel to the fire. Wright counters a side headlock with a wrist lock takedown and Big Mongo realises he's in the ring with an absolute wrestling god. This is like wrestling 5 Jeff Jarrett's or 20. Wright shows us why he's a master of wrist action by bringing Mongo down twice with the same hold. A few European uppercuts follow. The two then run into each other with shoulder blocks and Big Steve takes a short trip to space before this happens. Thankfully Mongo snaps out of it, we see a hip toss, McMichael lays in a few strikes and he pulls Alex down from the top rope by grabbing his sexy little tights. Alex then tries to counter the onslaught with a signature Mongo move, the tombstone. Steve tries to reverse it and he falls down. It's not great is it? He gets his ass up, we then see the Mongo tombstone. That should be it all over but Deborah distracts the referee. Now this is probably the stupidest, dumbest, longest referee distraction you'll ever ever see in your life. Because newcomer Charlie Robinson doesn't notice Bill fucking Goldberg jumping into the ring. Goldberg's in there for 12 seconds before hitting the spear. But then he also hits a jackhammer. And then he lifts Alex right up and he throws Alex on top of Mongo for the cover. All this and the referee didn't suspect a single fucking thing. The only saving grace in all this is the fact we see Mongo getting speared and jackhammered but you'll laugh when watching this back. 
Alex wins via pinfall and Debra has a little payment for Goldberg, Mongo's Super Bowl ring. Alex tries to shake Goldberg's hand but he gets punched in the mouth. Alex then gets tossed in the ring where he too takes a spear and a jackhammer and Goldberg leaves while still holding the Super Bowl ring. Still, Alex Wright won the match and that's all that matters. Well done Alex. Macho's wearing a sick jacket and it's gonna look better in colour. He says Hogan and Bischoff's dealings with WCW don't affect him at all because DDP's a marked man and Randy's match with Dallas is still going ahead as planned. Randy says he's gonna celebrate by snapping into a Slim Jim and after tonight, DDP can tell his grandchildren he once had a glimpse of greatness but he couldn't handle it because he's nothing compared to Randy Savage. Liz says DDP on his best day shouldn't be anywhere near Randy and Paige should really just leave the arena. Up next we have TV champion Disco Inferno taking on Jackie in a non-title match. And I do wish I could tell you what led to this match from a TV standpoint but there was nothing there. Jackie would show up during Disco's matches and Disco would do his best to avoid her. And that's it. In reality Disco was asked the job to Jackie previously and he refused. When he came back to WCW and when he signed a new contract, he agreed to do the job as originally intended and that's what we've got. I couldn't help feeling during the last few weeks of reliving the war that all this comes off as kinda petty and it feels like the fans suffered due to a backstage disagreement because the build up was woeful for what should have been a significant match. But even today, the whole thing about Disco agreeing to job upon signing his new deal completely overshadows the match itself and for an intergender match like this on WCW W programming in 1997, it should have been more. Just look at the amount of noise China made when she started wrestling guys. In saying all that, the match we have here is absolutely brutal and Disco's recent run of having more focused matches on TV was flushed down the toilet for the sake of proving a point. What you're seeing right now on your screen is all that happens during the first half of the bout. Disco refuses to wrestle and he runs away from Jackie. Jackie's able to perform a sunset flip eventually. Disco kicks out, he performs a drop toe hold and both he and his opponent act shocked that he actually performed a move on a woman. More stalling on the outside follows, Disco then performs an arm drag and again he won't follow up afterwards. More chasing around the ring follows and the inferno actually looks out of breath with all the running around he's been doing. Finally Jackie catches Disco and the TV champ takes a ton of punches while on the mat and he decides that's enough, he's gonna walk away and head back to the locker room. Jackie gives chase and Disco gets taken out. She then chases him back to the ring and we see some weak shoulder blocks. Jackie counters a hip toss and Inferno thinks he's being smart by throwing Jackie out of the ring but she comes back by smashing the Inferno's little Disco balls on the Slim Jim ring post. Disco gets suplexed on the outside. Jackie performs a nice float over DDT back in the ring but Disco rolls through after Jackie performs a top rope crossbody, only scoring a two count. The match ends when Disco complains to the referee and Jackie surprises Disco with a schoolboy pin. It's a noteworthy match for everything that happened backstage I know but what happened in the ring and what happened during the televised build up simply wasn't good. Jackie doesn't have another match in WCW, as a matter of fact the next time we see her compete in the ring is with the World Wrestling Federation in August of 1998. Kurt Hennig defended his US title next against nature boy Ric Flair. Flair wanted a little revenge for what happened to him at Fall Brawl when the former Mr. Perfect slammed the cage door on his head. Kurt doesn't have a chance to take off the robe he stole from Flair at the pay per view as Ric dashes to the ring and the match begins straight away. Flair destroys Kurt on the outside and we see some of those brilliant Kurt Hennig bumps when taking calf kicks. Kurt tries to leave after taking a hearty race knee but Flair chases Kurt and the two fight on the entranceway. When the match gets back inside the ring, Flair starts focusing his attacks on Kurt's leg. Hennig gets his leg wrapped around the ring post, Rick delivers a hard chop followed by a few lefts and rights and then he takes his signature robe back, getting a huge pop in the process. 
Kurt takes a knife edge chop when he runs at the nature boy. We see a little styling and profiling from Slick Rick. He takes the robe off and then Kurt floors him with a clothesline. What follows next is Hennig doing a lot of work to soften up Flair's leg, both men targeting the same limb it seems. They scrap for a bit when Rick gets an opening but Kurt goes straight back to the leg and honestly they're losing the crowd a bit here. Anytime the two go toe to toe Kurt's getting the better of Rick but the nature boy keeps coming back for more. Eventually Rick takes the corner bump, he falls out of the ring, Kurt goes back to attacking the leg and knee, this time using the guardrail for a little assist and Hennig brings Flair back inside the ropes with a neck snap. Flair finds himself in a sleeper but he gets out with a back suplex. Kurt gets an opportunity to lean Flair's head against the ring post. He then swings a chair at Rick but the nature boy moves out of the way. Flair makes Kurt pay with another hard knife edge chop, a few punches to the head and more styling and profiling. Rick's all fired up tonight at Halloween Havoc. More chops on the outside get followed up with a catapult into the ring post. Kurt takes a few punches on the jaw before the match gets back inside the ropes and after taking yet another chop, Kurt decides it's time to leave. He grabs his US belt, he heads back up the entranceway but once again Flair gives chase and the match continues. Kurt takes a knee drop before getting back in the ring but he's still holding his US belt. He intercepts Flair as the nature boy gets back inside the ropes and then he lines up a suplex on the US title. Flair counters it with a suplex of his own but he completes completely misses the championship belt. The match ends with Hanny getting hung up in the tree of woe. Flair places the US belt in front of Kurt's face and Flair kicks the belt. It's a DQ finish. Flair then attacks the referee and this leads to every WCW ref hitting the ring to stop Flair from doing any further damage. You may notice that Mark Curtis isn't here because he was diagnosed with cancer in October of 1997, but we will see him again on WCW television soon. Vincent and Conan come down to pull Hennig out of the ring and that's how it ended. It should have been better I think. Kurt and Flair had a great story heading into this one and a lot of time was invested in Hennig with his main event matches on Nitro and also a lot of time was put into Flair's comeback. I'm not so sure what else they could have done to be honest but for some reason I was expecting more. It was okay, it's not bad but just okay. Mean Gene interviews JJ Dillon, the first time we have seen JJ since he took a beating from Hollywood Hogan. So in regards to Hulk and Bischoff wanting Sting to stay away from the ring, Dillon says Hogan and Bischoff tried a grandstand play at the last minute tonight and Bischoff just wants Hogan out of the main event match, effectively sticking it to WCW's longtime viewers and that shit just won't fly with James J. Dillon. JJ announces the match is going to take place as advertised and then Eric Bischoff shows up. Eric says Dylan has no stroke in WCW, he has no authority, and as Bischoff continues to complain, JJ pulls out the match contract. He hands it to Eric, he makes Eric read over it, but Bischoff continues to say the match won't happen because Dylan can't make it happen. Dylan says Piper vs Hogan ends the show, and if Sting shows up in Eric's dreams tonight too, then that's Eric's problem to deal with also. Dylan leaves, Eric says he doesn't care about the contract. And Eric then curiously says, if Sting shows up tonight then the NWO want Nitro, as in they want to control Nitro. Why would WCW agree to give up Nitro if Sting shows up tonight? I, I don't get it. But those of you who paid close attention during 1997 would have heard this before. The idea of the NWO controlling Nitro has been hinted at quite a few times and in reality Eric did indeed want to test a complete NWO version of the Monday Night Show with the possibility of Nitro becoming an NWO exclusive telecast every Monday night. It's absurd to think about now I know, but WCW Thunder was coming soon and the initial very early idea was to have WCW Thunder and NWO Nitro. We're gonna see a test run for NWO Nitro very soon on Reliving the War and I can't say I'm looking forward to it too much. Should be interesting though when compared to Monday Night Raw. The living legend Larry Zbysko makes his way to the ring to officiate the upcoming Scott Hall vs Lex Luger match. At Fall Brawl 97, Larry cost Hall and Randy Savage a tag team victory over Luger and DDP when he pushed Scott into a roll up and Larry then counted the pinfall. The result was a race from the history books because Larry wasn't an officially sanctioned WCW referee, but interim commissioner Roddy Piper made Larry the special ref for tonight's one on one match between the bad guy and the total package. Six is here too, I made a mistake on 
reliving the war and I thought his final appearance already happened, but I think he's still injured here and he's let Bischoff know that he's not ready to compete in any matches. He appears on this show and he shows up on tomorrow night's Nitro and then he's done in WCW. So can Larry Zbysko be an impartial referee? That's the question. He said he didn't like Scott Hall but he wants to maintain his own integrity and the integrity of World Championship Wrestling by calling this one right down the middle. Zabisco takes the toothpick but Hall takes a shot from Luger immediately afterwards. Zabisco then forces both men to break when neither Luger nor Hall will let go after locking up and Larry makes Scott let go of a headlock when he pulled Luger's hair in order to apply the hold. He's being a little too strict here to start us off. Luger softens up the arm and shoulder, Hall makes it to the ropes and once again Larry has to jump in to break things up. Hall stares at Zabisco afterwards, probably wondering if Larry is indeed going to be a fair referee tonight. Scott suckers Lex in with a test of strength and the bad guy drives his knee into Luger's back. Lex tries to break free but Scott keeps the submission locked in and it feels like it's locked in forever. Lex counters and it's a bad counter, look right here, Hall's the one holding on to Lex for fuck's sake. Still, Lex keeps the pressure on with a few punches in the corner but Hall replies with an inverted atomic drop followed by a big clothesline. The clothesline seems to piss Zabisco off. Scott gives Larry a thumbs up before using the ropes to choke Lex. Larry gives Hall a 5 count and he puts his hands on Scott when the bad guy doesn't break the hold. Six then gets caught out by Larry when he tries to punch Luger in the face. Hall then delivers a corner clothesline, he covers Lex. Zabisco begins to count and Hall complains that it was slow. Luger takes the fallaway slam and this time Six complains about the count. The counts have been fine by the way, Larry's doing a good job. Lex gets locked in a sleeper and again this one stays in for quite some time. Lex gets out with a back suplex but it's Hall who's able to make the cover afterwards. Hall and Six complain again about the slow count but Larry stands his ground and the match continues. Scott kicks Luger out of the ring and Lex has a real hard time getting back inside. Hall stops Luger at every opportunity and Larry has to step in. He pulls Hall away from Lex, Hall shoves Zabisco and Zabisco backdrops Scott out of the ring when Hall tries to attack. Bischoff shows up to complain about Larry's officiating but Larry kicks Eric off the apron and he begins a 10 count. This got a great reaction by the way. Both Hall and Lex get back in the ring, the two go toe to toe. Lex gets the better of Hall with a few clotheslines and a few inverted atomic drops. We see the bionic forearm and Lex signals for the rack. Eric distracts Zabisco, Six comes in and he kicks Luger and that's how it ends. Scott Hall performs the outsider's edge and Larry has no choice but to count Lex's shoulders to the mat. Scott Hall wins via pinfall. After making Larry raise his hand in victory, Scott heads back up the ramp. Larry then demands to see a replay and after he sees what happened he announces that the match isn't over and he begins counting out Hall. Scott rushes back to the ring, he begins shouting at Zabisco and pushing him around. Just like Fall Brawl, Larry pushes back and this time Hall finds himself in the torture rack. Larry calls for the bell and Lex wins via submission. Then Zabisco gets attacked by Six. Larry manages to catch Six and he applies a guillotine choke but the numbers are too much when Bischoff and Scott get in on the action. Zabisco gets beaten down badly and it ends with Bischoff putting his foot on Larry while Scott counts to 3. You kinda know what to expect when going into this one with the special referee and all that stuff so I actually thought this was fine all things considered. A straight Hall vs Luger match would have been good but that's not what was advertised really so you can't be too critical. Next up we have the Las Vegas Sudden Death Match or uh, Texas Death Match or uh, Last Man Standing Match. Whatever you want to call it, the match can only end when either Randy Savage or Diamond Dallas Page can't get up after a 10 count. This is the last match in the DDP vs Savage trilogy, capping off a rivalry that would earn both men the PWI feud of the year and with everything that's happened in 1997 it's really quite the accomplishment. Page has re-injured his ribs apparently but he's gonna work the match anyway, giving the macho man a nice big target to aim for throughout the bout. The match starts with Dallas as the aggressor, going right after Macho on the outside. Savage gets a moment to recover when he pokes Dallas in the eye but Dallas stays on Randy and it's DDP who does the most damage in the early moments of the bout. Savage takes control back inside the ropes though, Page gets dropped across the top rope and Randy lays in the strikes in the corner. Sorry but I think Savage's gear looks awesome tonight. <laughs> the Macho Man gloats a little and he gives DDP a chance to get back up. Dallas ends up beating the shit out of Savage before both guys take each other out with a double clothesline. The referee gets to a 6 count before Dallas hits Savage with a swinging neckbreaker. Dallas then goes for the cutter but Macho gets out of harm's way and he goes to the outside. 
Dallas performs a plancha, he throws Savage into the guardrail, but Randy's able to hit the double axe handle from the top and neither man can maintain any kind of advantage here. Dallas gets clotheslined over the guardrail right in front of Raven and his cronies. The two then fight in the audience a bit and they end up on the entranceway with Savage in control. After a bit of fighting at the guardrail, Dallas manages to throw Savage into one of the prop headstones at the entranceway and Savage also gets slammed on a prop coffin. Randy then gets cracked with what looks like a tray and Dusty Rhodes loses his mind on commentary. Brother, he wobble leg to him! Did he wobble leg to him? <laughs> it's so good. Dallas lays in a few more punches before the two head back to the ringside area, and Randy takes the lead here. The Macho Man uses the ring steps to his advantage, Paige takes a beating before getting thrown back in the ring, and then the Macho Man decides he's gonna take a camera and use it to end this match. Savage lines up his shot, but DDP gets the feed up and the counter creates a great visual. Savage has been knocked out and the referee begins his count. Miss Elizabeth saves the Macho Man by smashing a tray over Mickey J's head. That's one way to do it I guess. Liz then chokes Paige with a cord and just seeing Liz getting so vicious makes the crowd pop. They go nuts again when Kimberly Page comes to Dallas's rescue. Kimberly grabs Liz by the hair and she drags her back up the entranceway, so we should now hopefully have a fair fight. Nick Patrick takes over referee duties. Both guys struggle to get to their feet, but it's Dallas who brings the fight to Savage. The Macho Man takes the pancake and DDP signals for the diamond cutter, but Macho holds onto the ropes and Page can't put the match away. Randy slowly climbs to the top. He drops the elbow, but he doesn't get all of it. So Dallas takes a body slam and then Randy goes back upstairs. We see another elbow drop and that's gonna be it all over. Somehow Dallas gets up at 9 and he manages to hit the diamond cutter but Patrick gets taken out too. He gets back up and he starts counting both men out. He gets to 8 before Paige and Savage stand back up. Paige goes for the cutter again but Randy counters and he hits a low blow. Dallas falls out of the ring and then a shit sting shows up. The shit sting whacks Paige with his baseball bat and now it's all over, really this time. Paige can't get up, Randy gets to his feet inside the ring, so Randy wins our Las Vegas sudden death match. Another good match at Halloween Havoc, though long term viewers may have been getting a little tired of these random stings showing up. Randy attacks Nick Patrick after the bell and he pushes the trainer off Paige. He wants to get in one last cheap shot. He walks back up the entranceway as medics put DDP on a stretcher. Randy gets in another cheap shot as Dallas gets brought to the back, and Tony Schiavone reveals that the shit sting was wearing Hollywood Hogan boots. So, how did Roddy Piper manage to get himself a cage match against Hollywood Hogan after not competing in the ring since Bash at the Beach? Well, after Hogan and Bischoff took out JJ Dillon, Piper was made the interim head honcho of the WCW Executive Committee, and he decided to book himself in a steel cage match against Hogan at Halloween Havoc. The cage match wasn't just plucked out of thin air either. Remember this pile of dog shit right here? Yeah, Piper's wanted a cage match with Hogan since uncensored, but seeing as his team lost in the NWO one, Piper didn't get his wish. With a little bit of power abuse though, you know, the same thing WCW cries about all the time in regards to the NWO, the Hot Rod was able to make his wildest dreams come true by facing Hollywood Hogan in a, get this, non-title steel cage match. Piper stole Hogan's belt on Nitro and he's yet to give it back, so you really could have betted your house on Roddy Piper winning this cage match. The predictability was absolutely off the charts. You know the last time Hogan wrestled on TV? Road Wild back in August. Yeah, the Luger match. I've heard this one being referred to as the quote age in the cage and while that's pretty funny, Hogan was 44 here and Piper was 43. Current AEW champion CM Punk is currently 43, Brock Lesnar is 44, AJ Styles is 45, Randy Orton's 42 at the time of making this video, you get the picture. Still, I get it too, there's really no age on a performer if they're still able to go, so let's see if Piper and Hogan performed here at Halloween Havoc. It starts with Hogan wanting to leave the cage, and you'll maybe think of the excellent work Shawn Michaels did inside Hell in a Cell, where he too wanted to leave a cage before facing The Undertaker. The difference here is, it just seems a bit more hokey when Hogan does it. Michaels made you believe for a moment that he was legit panicking, whereas Hogan just kinda shakes the cage a bit. Roddy Piper goes after Hulk, and after whipping him with his belt, he, uh... 
He eats his asshole. Seriously, he gets right in there too. Piper bites Hogan's back and forehead before throwing the NWO champ back inside the ropes. And here we go, God help us all, Hogan vs Piper at Halloween Havoc. <sighs> Alright, Piper pokes Hogan in the eye before delivering an atomic drop. We see the classic ear clap next and then Piper screams at Hogan to fight him as he kicks Hollywood on the mat. Hogan escapes the ring and he tries to climb out of the cage and… wait, did they explain the rules here? There's no referee so I'm guessing there's no pinfalls, let's go back to Michael Buffer. Alright, ok, so the winner of the match is the man who survives. That's it, so I'm guessing leaving the cage doesn't result in a victory. I don't know honestly. Back to the match and Hogan gets punched in the balls. There's a bit of countering before Hulk gets his head rammed into the cage panel but Hogan's first to his feet. He then orders Randy Anderson on the outside to open the cage door and Shivani says if Hogan leaves the cage then the match is over. Hogan steps out and the match continues. Shivani says it's only continuing because both guys stepped out at the same time but you can just tell he's making it up as he goes along. Hogan slams the cage door on Piper's head and he tries to leave the arena but his shit sting stops Hogan in his tracks, causing a lot of confusion saying his shit stings are usually associated with the new world order, usually. The match gets back inside the ring for all of 5 seconds because Hogan falls back to the outside. Hulk just won't take any hard bumps on the steel panels but Piper seems to not care and he takes the shots to the head full force. Hogan tries to climb the cage and Piper stops him. Another sting shows up to join whoever that other dude is at the entrance way. And when we go back to the cage, Hogan's stopping Piper from escaping. Piper then gets whipped in the ring with Hogan's belt. Hogan slaps Piper around while saying, I could do this all night long. He then tries to exit the cage again by climbing over, but he's stopped by a fake sting, and this gives Piper a chance to climb up and fight Hogan at the very top of the cage. Even Bobby Heenan praises the camera work here. More stings appear at the entranceway and in the audience. There's around 5 stings now watching the match but it looks like the real sting is unaccounted for. The match goes back to the ring where Piper chokes Hogan with his shirt. Hogan gets out by clocking Piper with the world belt. And we see Hogan's been busted open as Hollywood repeatedly slams Piper's head on the mat. Hulk then hits the leg drop and he calls the referee in to make the three count. I'm not even going to question it at this point, this is fucking dumb. Piper takes another leg drop by the time Pee Wee Anderson gets in the ring but he kicks out a two and Hulk can't believe it. Hogan calls for backup, Randy Savage runs down to the ring completely breaking through the oblivious fake stings. Savage climbs to the top of the cage and… It's definitely the moment of the match but man did that landing look painful. Piper throws Savage out of the ring, Hogan finds himself locked in the sleeper and the referee calls for the bell when Hogan can't raise his arm. Roddy Piper defeats Hulk Hogan once again in a non-title match. Randy Savage attacks Piper after the bell and Bischoff shoves a sting away to get inside the ring. Bischoff tends to Hulk while Savage continues beating on Piper. A fake sting loses his mask when he starts fighting with Hogan and Hulk throws this shit sting out of the ring. Piper ends up getting handcuffed to the cage and Hulk puts on a sting mask before punishing Piper with his belt. A quote fan then climbs into the cage and the fake sting has to hold the fan down and then Hollywood and Savage end up getting a hold of this poor guy and he gets beaten up pretty bad. It's 100% a plant, Hogan's throwing work punches here. Security rush in to save the fan and the show goes off the air with the fan getting carried away by security. Brutal, absolutely brutal, the most clustered fuck of 1997 and a prime example of how WCW main events could really stink up a pay per view. Unfortunately, this is something that would continue more often than not. Where was the real sting after all that nonsense with Bischoff and JJ Dillon? What was the point in the fake stings even being there? Why again didn't anyone from WCW come out to help Piper? I've legitimately got a ton more questions that I've wrote down here that need answers and I'm sure you do too but anyway Hogan's got his NWO belt, Piper's got another victory over the champion and I'm gonna go and get a drink. Main event aside, I enjoyed Halloween Havoc 1997 more than I thought I would. I've seen Mysterio vs Guerrero countless times now and I've watched Page vs Savage quite a few times too. 
Alex Wright vs Mongo was well below average but the Goldberg interference kinda saved it, Disco vs Jackie was shit in my opinion, but I had fun watching the opener, the Jericho match, the Luger match and Flair vs Hennig wasn't terrible either. Not WCW's best pay per view of the year but it had an absolute classic with Ray vs Eddie and that alone would have been worth the price of admission. Reliving the war will be available on Thursday as usual and we'll take a look at the Halloween Havoc fallout in episode 105. Thanks for watching this one guys, I do appreciate it and take care.